from Hallmark. A wish that all our families can be together this Christmas. I want you to listen to this. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. Bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens. Brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Happy holidays from Blood and Black Rum Podcast. This Christmas, we're doing something slightly different. We're bringing you on an adventure through Hallmark Christmas movies, specifically those starring Lisey Chabert, in a series we're calling Chabert and Gifts. You can expect visits from Christmas past and present, trips through Rome, and a whole lot more. We hope you enjoy our very festive and slightly romantic approach to this year's Christmas season. And just remember, heavy petting is not allowed. Goulet! Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. Ryan from CoolPlantation.com, and I'm joined with my co-host, Mark. How's it going? Doing well, and again, we are not bringing you Festivus this year, but a different style of holiday movie hijinks. This time, we're talking about Hallmark movies, uh, a brand of movies that we've never talked about before. (laughs) But you know what? Somebody needs to. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Besides the middle-aged ladies' water cooler talk, that's right. I, I I mean I think we're doing a good service. We're doing we're ensuring that Hallmark has the uh you know has the audience to continue to give Lacey Chabert roles and you know, to continue to have her executive produce these movies. Listen, after Black Xmas, nobody thought her career would. Would skyrocket the way it has. Well, I was going to say rebound, you know. I was to no, to no fault of her own, because it wasn't Lacey Chabert's fault that the movie was bad. She was perfectly fine at it. And pretty great. It's just a dog shit movie. But you know what? She's something. All right. That's right. Um, yeah, so but this season, we're bringing you Lacey Chabert Hallmark movies in a in a series that we're calling Chabert and Gifts. I feel like I always need to I need to bring that up in every episode and just make sure that everybody understands the pun that's in the title because again uh, 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 I, I still think I still think people think it's like Sherbert and Gifts or something like that. Well, See, no, nobody says Sherbert right the anyway. delicious delicious style of ice cream for the Christmas season. Uh, it's actually sherbet, sherbet, not sh- sherbet, but sherbet, and sorbet. No, that's sorbet. You know what? Too um, while I was doing some research on Hallmark movies, I did notice that it's speaking. This is this is uh, this going to relate to sorbet? I'm just so you. Just, I noticed that we missed out on doing a Hallmark movie with a. Uh, I would I'll say a um a figure that has come under criticism of late. Who do you think we that missed, is? We missed the James Woods sighting. Oh no, sorry, not James Woods, although he is an asshole, always is. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, hold on. He'll be. Hold on. It's not just James Wood a- asshole. It's fucking asshole. <laughs> no, it's James Wood, renowned Twitter asshole. That's <laughs> true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not James Woods. It's uh, you're you're on the right track though, and it it ties in with sorbet. Just a no guesses. No, a Kevin Sorbo Christmas. <gasps> yes, yes, we missed out on that. I did know. I see. I saw that there was one. There was a uh, Kevin Sorbo Christmas. I believe. I believe it was Christmas. I can't remember now, but it definitely came up for me for for Hallmark. So, yeah, we missed out on that one. No, what we missed out on is doing Hercules with Kevin Sorbo. That's right. Um, all right, so this time for the Shebering Gifts, um, we're going a little bit more. So last time I, we did Christmas in Rome, which is kind of an old, you know, it's not super old, but it's an older Kong Walmart Christmas movie. Yeah. And this time we're doing a, a much more recent 
a uh, Hallmark Christmas movie starring Lacey Chabert. I think she gets in her contract one Christmas movie a year now, I think. Something like that. Like, Because they, they pump it out so many. But I think she gets at least one a year. So this one is actually from 2022. Came out last year during the Christmas season. And uh, it got a sequel this year. And I, we almost did the sequel. And I was like, whoa, hold on. How will we ever understand the dynamics of what's going on in this movie when we haven't seen the the first one? Which would have made it a lot funnier, too. <laughs> it, it probably would have, yeah. It yeah. probably would have been a little bit more interesting to go into the sequel and just be like, all right, I don't know what's going on. But no, we're, we're going to tackle the first one. And uh, it's called Haul Up the Holly. Or ha- I'm sorry, <laughs> I butchered the name of the title. Right away. What's your name right away? No, it's called Haul Out the Holly. And uh, it's, that's the uh, porn version of it. Haul up the holly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it, this one is, you know, obviously playing off of the the um, wonderful Christmas time song. Uh, we need a little Christmas. Uh, not my favorite. Not my favorite song. How's that go? Yes, we need a little Christmas. Right this very minute. The thing that comes to mind, actually, unfortunately, when I think about this song, um, is yes, it was done by who the fuck did it? Um, fucking uh, someone, someone uh, very, po- you know, popular back in the fifties. Um, uh, who was it? Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis. Um, y- yes, it was done by Johnny Mathis, but. The thing that really always I I note is that the fuck the fucking Glee version of it, the one that the Glee cast did, because it's super obnoxious, and that really ties right back into this movie, into Haul Out the Holly on Hallmark Channel. Wow, you watch you you watch Glee? No, no, they but they did a rendition of it, and they play it on the radio sometimes for for Christmas, and it's 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 like it's so over the top theatrical, and it just every time I hear it, it makes me very angry. <laughs> it makes me it makes me get uh upset because it's so theatrical. Um so it that makes sense. It ties in with Haul Out the Holly because I do feel like this movie is also very obnoxious and uh nauseating because of the way that it um uh, goes about like its business and um what I will say is, you know, we did Christmas in Rome and we tolerated that movie. We I you know, I thought it had like an endearing charm to it at times, you know, even though it's not I'm not the you know the the main person who would be marketing get marketed this movie. So I thought that one was endearing a little bit, but Hall of the Holly is completely the opposite at least for me. Um I don't know how you felt about it getting into it. I did, you don't have to go into specifics, but uh was it as charming as Christmas in Rome? No, not at all. Um because it's uh menagerie of kind of cheeky ripoffs and autistic Mormon <laughs> spirit. <laughs> <laughs> like I think like uh, Christmas in Rome is like different enough to be like, oh okay, but like even if you didn't say it, I would probably come to mind as watching like, oh my God, this is Christmas with the cranks, but fucking more autistic and more (laughs) Mormon goodness. Like, yeah, someone got into the baking sugar and, uh, sucked that up their nose during the making of this movie. Cause, cause it is, it is Utah. So I thought at first it was like Wyoming, like, like, Oh, look at those mountain vistas. Yeah. yeah. And then like, as soon as I saw the place, it was like, Oh, it's it's in Utah. The Utes. But I mean, like, it, I didn't really have an expectation overall, though. Like going into, as like, like I was just kind of thinking, like, how bad could it be? You know, like, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of like, because I didn't really look at the cast or anything. I just knew it had Lacey Chabert, and mm-hmm. you know, she has kind of something we picked. She's a generational talent. Well, I picked it because this one, just because of the fact that you almost made us watch the sequel to it. Mm. So it's like, well, we got to watch this one. Got to get it in. Because yeah. now we know that there's a sequel. We we have to. True. So. Yeah. 
Right. And, and, and the picture, the poster for it's so great, like her plugging into the light like she did something. Like, <laughs> hey, look, I put the accessory, I put the pull, I put, <laughs> put a strand up. Yeah. Well, well, with the dude in the background, like, that's great, honey. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's take a break real quick, talk about the beer that we got on the show today, and then we'll, we'll dive into uh, All Up the Holly. So, we get, I'll let, actually, I'll let you take it because this is your beer this week. So, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, describe what's going on. Uh oh, that's a mistake. So, one of the beers that we should be sponsored by, breweries that we should be sponsored by at this point due to all the product placement and uh, reviews we do, is. Uh, a local wonder based out of Cooperstown, New York. You might have heard of it before if you're a regular listener and live in upstate New York. It's Brewery Gang. And they have their lovely little OMG series, which is their nice canned line of uh, 16 ounce, like four packs of beers that stray away from the, the traditional beers that they do, which are Belgian in style, because they are, are also owned by Duval Mortcott. So if you like Duval, you would like uh, Brewery Amage. But last year, I think was the first year, is either last year or two years ago, when they did the Everything Nice, which was a like holiday spice uh, ale. And we did that on the show, but we liked it quite a bit. Thought it was pretty good. Um, Yeah, Everything Nice. Let me pull that up. Uh, which was a strong blonde ale. It was either last year or two years ago we did it. And it was nice. It's got cinnamon. Two, two years ago. Cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, white pepper. You know. It was a nice, like, heartwarming beer. Right for the season. Uh, a nice slow sipper. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year, they have that beer still out. Because I did see it again, too. Um, but they have a counterpoint to that. in their, Which is in their... OMG series, which is the Everything Naughty. Ooh la la. Hmm? And this beer is a fucking conundrum. It's a total, like, antithesis beer. Like, uh, it's a white chocolate imperial blonde stout. Now, I think I've maybe had, like, one of these, one of these styles of beers before, but it's hard to, I don't even think I poured it out when I had it. But pouring this out and having it is like the weirdest like experience ever <laughs> because like it's a blonde stout and you look at it and it's basically it's literally just like like a blonde ale like a golden ale like it looks so like you would never pour with, like if you so uh, if you were at anywhere in a bar you're like I want to have a stout and the bartender gave you this you would never be like oh so look at that it's a stout you'd be like what the yeah, I mean it's 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 an interesting style because it is basically, for all intents and purposes, a stout. But with the stouts, generally they get their dark color from you know the roasted barley, roasted malts that they're using, uh, black malts, uh, chocolate malt stuff like that. Not in chocolate malt, not referring to the actual flavor of chocolate, but mm. the, the the color of it. Um, but in these cases, it's kind of interesting because they do get the same some a lot of similar flavors of a stout. But without the dark roasted color to it, and this is literally like Crystal Pepsi. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you see, like if you ever got to experience Crystal Pepsi, which I did when they re-released it a couple years ago, and you're like, oh, that can't taste like cola because when you see a clear soda, you think of like something citrusy, lemon and lime, and then you drink the cola, the Crystal Pepsi, you're like, oh my god, it's Pepsi. <laughs> So like it's just, if you're like it's the same thing here. Your brain's like that's yeah, not stouty, and then you drink it and you're like, oh my god. Yeah, I mean, I feel like again the blonde stout style is kind of like another sort of brewer style, um, where you know as a as a consumer you can appreciate the idea of the blonde stout. You can see it. You can literally see it. Like this is a little different than the cold IPA and the fact that like you can't see anything different about it. You can't. You barely taste anything different about it. But it's different. Um, the blonde style you can see differently, and you could you can tell okay they brewed it differently. Um, like you're never gonna get the overall like very thick 
syrupy, molassesy flavors of a blonde stout, just because part of that is ingrained with the whole roasted barley, roasted malt element to it. So they're they're gonna not be as thick and and syrupy as some of the other ones can be. But at the same time, they do get a lot of the same flavors as a stout. And it's it's just an interesting idea, but it doesn't really make much impact to the drinker except that it's the, a different color you know what i mean and like if you don't pour it out too uh and you didn't even look and he's like ah it says it's a stout i don't know and you just drink it and you're like okay yeah it's stout so like that's kind of the whole interesting idea of it is like besides literally visually looking at it really doesn't make that much <laughs> much of a difference <laughs> um but it's kind of an interesting style it's like a it's a brewer style to say hey made a blonde stout or a golden stout um it's kind of cool I, I like the idea and i like the idea of doing it for the holidays for for as like a um a holiday beer a christmas beer um for the everything naughty because it does have is sort of like you said it's like kind of the antithesis it's not a winter ale it's not a dark stout um it's it not even like you know like a peppermint stout or anything like that because some people uh for the holidays to put out like their, you know, their peppermint stouts, things like that. Uh, it's sort of an antithesis of what you would expect. And that's why it's called everything naughty. Um, so I, I like it. I think it's kind of cool. So let's talk about the flavor of it. So this is a white chocolate Imperial blonde stout. What do you think about the, what do you think about that white chocolateness of this beer? As I take a sip, I love it. Cause I love white chocolate. So that is like a nice touch. Um, it's definitely got a white chocolatiness to it. Has a nice, slight coffee taste to it. Nice little bready, ta- uh, malty taste to it. Crisp, easy to drink. Doesn't feel like you're drinking a nine and a half percent beer. Doesn't really have a overall alcoholic taste to it either. If you don't like that, which I'm not the biggest fan of, if you listen to the podcast. But it does warm you up nice inside, make you feel good. It does have like a nice little cinnamon, a little bit of nutmeg in there too, to pair with it to make it, you know, feel that nice yuletide joy in your soul. I like this a lot. It's just, like, yeah, it's just kind of weird to look at because it's just like so, such a paradox. I know it's a thing. But, like, just seeing it out in the wild, you're like, holy shit, yeah. It works. Um, so, And I think you're right, too, because from just looking briefly online of, like, how they kind of make blonde stouts, and it's not just, like, you know, like, using lighter molds, but, like, if you want to add, like, the more chocolatey and coffee taste to that, they add that as part of the process. So it's kind of like a weird novelty that someone, like, that someone thought, like, what if I brewed a beer to make a stout and I just use pale molds and I added in like the coffee and the chocolate and this, you know, to it as we were brewing it to see what happens. It's a unique idea. And I think it's a, a nice style. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, so yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. I, th- I think that, um, this is a really interesting beer. Like for me, I don't like white chocolate, really not a fan of white chocolate in general. For one thing, it's a lie in the name. It's not chocolate. It's not fucking chocolate. Um, it's basically like sugar, milk, and vanilla, possibly. And it's like all blended together. And it's like eating uh, like a really sweet something. Like it, it just doesn't have like the, the bite that I think chocolate has. So this why, I think that's why I don't really like it. It's like, I don't know. It just has like an off-putting flavor to me. So coming into this, I was like, mm, light chocolate in my stout. But... It actually turns out really well, and I think it turns out so well because it does blend with that blonde stout flavor where the white chocolate is not um, super overpowering, but it does have like a nice sweet, uh, creamy, sugariness, uh, a little bit of vanilla to it um, that goes well with the stout. And then along with that, you do, uh, towards the end, I do get just a tiny bit of like spice, like winter spice, like uh, clove or nutmegs, or uh, not nutmeg, but like more like clove. Um, all all spice yeah or all spice yeah just a just a tad it's just like to give it that nice little like winter ale spiciness uh which i think works well as well in this in this scenario because it it all kind of blends really well together 
Um, I've had a, I think I've had like one other blonde stout, and I really like that one too. And I think this one is um in a similar vein to it, but a, the, that little added white chocolate sweetness to it, and just a little bit of spice gives it that nice like holiday Christmas flavoring that I think goes really well in this um you know themed beer. So I think they really did a really good job. And to be honest with you. Um, this is part of the OMG series. I don't think the other one, the the everything nice is technically part of the OMG series unless they change that around for the last time. No, I right like the it, normal line. It's still it's their uh, limited release, right? Yeah, but but honestly, I think like both of these together be be a really good pairing because they are so different. You get like a nice winter style Belgian, and then you've got the nice like stout that kind of is very, you know, different texturally from from the two. So, uh it's a cool concept. I like that they did they did both of them this year and uh I'm impressed, you know, the um, OMG series we've been pretty impressed with for the most part. I mean, there've been a couple missteps, but for the most part, I think we've liked almost every single beer that they put out in the series. Um it's great to see them experimenting. I I like that a lot. Trying different trying different things uh things that maybe sometimes take them outside of the Belgian style. So very cool. Um, and this is 9.5. So it's a bit dangerous. It don't feel like it. Like you said, like, yeah, it's, kind of, it, it's definitely nice that, uh, it, as you're drinking it, it's, you know, like you said, it doesn't really have like a strong alcohol taste to it, but definitely when you, as you're drinking it, you do feel like a nice warm sensation. Like mm-hmm. you are drinking something with high ABV. Yeah, um, and I let this one ro- warm to room temperature too. I didn't keep it uh, cold. It's, it's nice. It's very nice. Which they just say do say with this one, not to. Um, on the website, it says for aging notes, they say drink fresh. So this is not one to stow away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They also suggest for the glassware, use a chalice. Honey, huh? get my chalice right out. They do have is the says, get your own here. You can buy an everything naughty chalice. Oh wow! On their website, cool. All right, let's talk about all out the holly. Um, all right, so let's start. I guess let's just start from the beginning because I think that the beginning is <laughs> <laughs> the matter. You know the fact that you're already speechless is really sad. I know. I think, no, I think you're. I think you're underselling. Uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to find the best place to start talking about this movie. Um. So basically, the movie starts out. This, uh, you know, introducing us to the characters. You got. We got young Lacey Chabert. And uh, what I thought was really funny is that, like, if you were to look at all the set design and the exteriors and things like that, even the camera cinematography, nothing pinpoints to you. That this takes place in the past. They didn't even put like a, a filter on to show like, oh, it's like kind of a yellowy filter, so it's like sepia toned a little bit. No, um they just they don't even try really. They just basically show a young Lacey Chabert. She gets a Polaroid, so you know, oh, gotta be in the past a little bit. Like she's getting a Polaroid camera right out of the box in twenty twenty-three. Um and then you see her parents, and her parents are looking like mighty aged for having a what like five year I don't even know how old she is five seven year old um and it's just her parents that are going to end up playing Lacey Chabert's parents uh later on so like an older version of this young girl Emily and uh yeah that's that's how it starts out and 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 how they basically have been living in this like nice little community everybody pitches in and they have basically it's Christmas day and everybody's going out of their way to like go to some Christmas carnival on Christmas day. Like they're like, what spend time with the relatives? No, fuck no. We're going to the Christmas carnival today. Everybody's got a pitch in. So it really sets up, sets you up for this like small town community. In this Which place. is fucking stupid. Like what a psycho these parents are. Can I open a present? No, <laughs> no, you absolutely cannot. We need to get to the carnival. Fucking Dan down the road is coloring out <laughs> this goddamn log sculpture of Rudolph, and his wife is handing out homemade spiced eggnog that she's been fermenting rum for in the back 
that she got molasses from her trip down to Tahiti. Not only, yeah, not only. You got what's your fucking gold can? Not on. only that, but the HOA had to hire some poor bastard clown to be the ringleader at the carnival. He's got to leave his family. He's we actually had to ship him in, and he's been been out of town from his his family for Christmas for like two weeks now. So no. You get your ass over to that carnival. We are which, not putting gifts right now. Which, by the way, if you're not bourgeois, uh, HOA stands up for Homeowners Association, which is uh, one of the fucking dumbest things that America and white people have thought of. I'm sorry. Isn't everyone clamoring to live in an HOA? I thought everybody knew what that was because this movie makes it seem like everybody's like, an HOA? Well, let me move in over there. I fucking love HOAs. They tell me exactly how I need to do things. You don't like you don't like having some seventy year old retiree. You're like, excuse me, excuse me. Hey, hey, I know you've been working six days a week, but hey, hey, your grass two and three quarters of an inch too high. Okay, you you need to get that back in compliance. Hey, listen here. Hey, hey, you little shit. While my grandfather was winning World War II, you need to be out here cutting your grass. Hey, me. Stupid. Fucking stupid. Yeah, so I mean, that, that basically sets it up for the plot. And, and, and at the beginning of the movie, too, you do meet the uh, the other kid that, like, lives in this uh, nightmare scape in uh, the movie. Um, Nerd and, boy. Yeah. And eventually... He grows up and becomes the president of the HOA. And an architect. And an architect. And he's a... he's the father of the Brady Bunch. An architect. And according to the characters in this movie, a very handsome young man. But the best part is, is you know, when we see Lacey in her adulthood and this nice, like, Brooklyn-style apartment of brick walls, her boyfriend, they had the, the calmest fight ever. Like... Yeah, that's she comes home. She comes home like at the beginning of the movie, and she's got stacks of presents. She just comes in. And he's like, "Whoa, what's what's all that?" It's like they're all presents for you. It's like fucking like fifteen presents coming in. I know we're only two movies in, but these are like the most mal, like well mannered, like well adjusted people, like having the most sane arguments. Like, <laughs> like she doesn't have raised voices at all. Like, like she's not drinking a bottle of like you know fucking chief wine to get into a fight or anything they're having like this like well articulated fight of like I like you but I, I mean I'm not I don't want to have this talk well, we need to have this talk do I well I don't want to have it okay then we're breaking up we're breaking up yeah we're breaking up oh okay yeah it's by, the way, the, by, the, by the way by, by the way I signed my name on the lease one last year when we had to renew it so you're out of luck yeah. Oh darn! Yeah, it's basically yeah the equivalent <laughs> of just like them having like an a, a problem with uh, what they're gonna have for dinner or something. They're like, oh man, you got chicken? I was expecting steak. Uh, oh, dollar, and I guess we'll. Wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What do you mean you made Swedish meatballs? I th- I, th- I thought I want I want spaghetti and meatballs. I thought you wanted Swedish meatballs tonight, so we were doing egg noodles and butter and gravy and meatballs. I mean, it it, uh, it plays off as hilarious because it is ridiculous in like some alternate reality where this would occur. But also, you know, I guess it does. We've like you said, we've only done two so far, but it does point to the same issues in this movie is that th- these Hallmark movies aren't even allowed to have like a real fight. There's no real no modicum conflict. of of conflict whatsoever. If like if somebody got into a fucking head-on collision in this movie they'd all get out and be like are you okay oh my gosh that was so scary i'm so glad you're fine there wouldn't, there wouldn't be somebody coming out of like out of the wreck like what the fuck <laughs> yeah <it's> like, <laughs> yeah like, honestly though i kind of wish that it would like i kind of wish everything would play out in this weird hallmark-esque element and then all of a sudden you get this like very horrendous like somebody crash somebody goes <laughs> through the windshield <laughs> holy fuck it's that's yeah, no, like it's, it goes like, to like zero to one thousand in the just like yeah, no, like everything is so just like well tamed and like well be like again, like these are the most well adjust like 
Wait, what Bible schools are they going to? Where everyone's just like, oh, okay. Yeah, even even like like the conflict in this movie that um, Lisa Chabert has with one of her neighbors, Pamela, is like so mundane. Because like Pamela, they're always like, oh, Pamela's so tough. She's like, she's yeah. It is even even then, she's just like kind of surly. She's like, I'm upset you came over at five fifteen instead of four o'clock, like you said. <laughs> it's like, that's like the argument. There's no real conflict to it. There's no um, raising voices. They're literally, well, the only thing we got, the, got out of that is her kid's like, yeah, mommy filled up the swear jar. She's like, you don't need to talk about. <laughs> There's just, these movies just, it's like Hallmark is afraid to like show that like there's any like darkness in the world whatsoever. It's like when you get into a argument. That's why they're in Happy Land Mormon Town and the fucking Utah Mountains where everything's just so gosh darn beautiful. Like, do you do you think that that works for people who watch these? I mean, obviously it does because people come back to them. But, like, think about it logically. and You watch a movie and you're like, everybody is so nice in this movie. Wouldn't it kind of make you hate your own reality just a little bit more? It's like, wow, my fucking world is shit right now. No, everybody's no, yelling at me at work. No, 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 no. No one gets yelled at. No, no, no. It, no, it doesn't make me feel good because I'm always down for a fight. For so, this is literally infuriating. This, me. this, this is like get angry, get mad, like that. Like, if, if, as like I'm co- coming closer and closer to like 35, like I've cooled down quite a bit, but I still love a good fucking argument in a fight, and I curse too damn much, and I know that, but at the same time, it's like, well, like th- this to me is like fucking utopian nonsense bullshit. It's like, come on. Like, you know, we, we used to, uh, one of our friend, uh, friends that's moved away, they used to yell at him, like, when I'd be hanging out with him, because we'd be playing in a game or something. I'd be like, God fucking damn it! And he'd be like, yeah, I'm mad too. I'd be like, no, you're not! If you're really like, yeah, I'm mad too, that's, you're, no, you're not mad! This is a inconvenience. <laughs> You know, like you're not, you're like you don't truly understand like anger and fury at all. Like if you're just like I'm mad too, it's like no, you're not. No, you're not. So like here, like all these people, I would like literally find to be intolerable because they're such fucking Mary Sue's. Yeah, and like that's that's the thing about the opening is like the even the conflict that brings Lacey Chabert, her character Emily, back to home in Utah. That you know kind of like sets this plot all in motion it's really not much of a conflict they just break up and she's like well i think we're breaking up and he's like okay uh i didn't want to break up i said like, well we are <laughs> well, yeah and it's it's like uh like a second grade relationship they're like we're not together anymore okay um <laughs> fine i didn't even realize we were together can i call you <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like this it's it's fucking yeah it's it's so it's it operates outside of any kind of reality but that's what people want when they watch this movie, apparently. They, they just want, like, you know. Not only that, too, when they break up, she's, like, and she finds out that, you know, her ex-boyfriend has, like, sniped the lease out from under her. Uh, she's like, I'm staying in the room until we I move out to my parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, oh, yeah, we just got into this fight. We just broke up. It's okay if I stay in the kids' room. Yeah. Until I f- find a place, you know. So she ends up moving out to Utah to visit her parents, and her parents are like, yeah, come on down, come on in. Um, we'll be here. Uh, we're celebrating Christmas right now, and they they're like implementing fucking Christmas with the cranks level. Like, no, no, Claire's coming home. She's coming home. Get shit together. So they got their like peppermint stick walkie talkies out. They're like, calling Frohmeyer, Frohmeyer, Vic Frohmeyer, get get the town together. But in this case, it's Stephen Tobolowski. Who's putting in entirely too much work for this movie? Um, the man is going like above and beyond any real like call of duty that they should have had for him in this movie. Literally the thespian. On this <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's like <laughs> getting a Malcolm McDowell in here. To... <laughs> and what? Well, because well, we don't have Frank O'Neill this time around. I just so, imagine like no, him going no, up on set the... like. No, no, he didn't get invited. He lives in Utah. Oh, yeah. And they're filming on this cul-de-sac. He's like, can I, can I, can I participate? I know. I feel like he, they just, he was just there and he like was on set. He like clapped his hands. He's like, 
Ooh, well, what are we doing? What are we up to? And then he just like got to town and he just like started making up beats about his character because um yeah, he's he's putting in entirely too much work. He's 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 on on three levels higher than pretty much everybody else in this movie. Um so yeah. But uh other than that, like this movie set you know it sets up a basically a Christmas with the crank style element where it's like, oh, Emily's come home for Christmas. Except in this case, like and her parents are still skipping Christmas. Like still the whole same idea of like skipping Christmas. Except in this case, we don't follow them trying to skip Christmas, like in Christmas with the Cranks. We follow Lacey Chabert, who's been shoehorned into this really bad situation where her parents say, Hey, um, thanks for coming down. Uh thanks for flying out to Utah or whatever. Uh you're Ticket round trip ticket cost two thousand dollars. Travel during the holidays five five days before Christmas. Uh, hope the airport. Yeah, yeah, last yeah last minute. Sorry you couldn't book. You know, sky blue or something. You're on Southwest and you still had to pay an arm and a leg. Yeah. Uh. Uh. And then when she gets there, they're like, um, "We're going. Well, we're, we're leaving. We're we're going to Florida. We're moving to Florida." And uh, they're in. You know, like they're you know their Hawaiian shirts and stuff. And so like immediately she's she's. Basically, they say, we're leaving you the house. Um, yeah, we got a pretty strict HOA around here. So, uh, well, because her parents were the, the head. Yeah, they, they father, started. They started. Her father, yeah. yeah. Her father wrote the bylaws. And it's like, well, get a job, you asshole. <laughs> like, 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 he must have one. They have a fucking like, yeah, million like, dollar house there. I know, but we need, like, we, like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, in your time, like, your time off, Start you're time. on. All right, that's what you're going to do. You're going to be like, all right, I'm going to go around and I'm going to create everyone's fucking Christmas decorations. They have to be up to snuff. And it's like, wait, what if? Well, this is a Hallmark America, so there's no Jews around. But like, what if a Jew lived in the fucking neighborhood? They're like, <laughs> they've already run them out. <laughs> you don't even make it to buy the house. <laughs> what are you talking about? Gold, Goldsmith, get, get the fuck out of here. Like, yeah, Rick. You just, you, you just don't get it. During the normal times, they've got a different walkie-talkie with Stephen Tobolowski running around fucking sabotaging things while the Jews try to move in the neighborhood. And you, like you were saying, this movie has nary a black person either. It's like just at the end of the movie, it's like one person walks by and what you don't see is like them sticking a Doberman on them afterward. It's like... Getting hauled off by the state police, like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you, you don't see them later on, like walkie talking. The police were like, "We've got a vicious person in the neighborhood here on Christmas." Yeah, because that's basically yeah, yeah. You, honestly, though, yeah, we don't even know what the town name is. They just refer to the street they live on, Evergreen Lane, Lane, <laughs> and it's not even a fucking lane. It's a goddamn called yeah, so fuck like cul de sac, yeah. What I think too is like this cul-de-sac, um, as they show it too, when uh, Lacey Chabert is getting there, looks like it's like the middle of nowhere, Utah. Yeah, and, uh, we said like that's why we thought it was, that's why before we saw a play, I thought it was like Wyoming. When we see like the mountains, it's all like I'm like, oh, it's some butt fuck town and unforgiving. Like I expect Clint Eastwood to come walking out and unforgiving and be like, oh yeah, well you know, it's like. like you're in Valent- you're in Valentine in Red Dead too, like you know, out in the high plains, and only only thing in the the you know ten mile area is this one cul de sac built up around nothing. And the general store, you gotta go there and get your get your t- you know your consumption medicine. Yeah, your Bibles. It's hilarious because it it definitely looks like one of those like uh, movie sets where it's just like yeah, you see the exteriors that are just built and they like, just keep reusing these. Especially given the fucking cost of the houses that are on this strip. I imagine because it's out there, it's cheaper, you know. Yeah. It, they don't pay the tax revenue <laughs> that we do up here in upstate New York. But no, I mean, it is re- kind of ridiculous, so to think about. Like, the whole, like, I, like, to me, like, you know, and you've been calling me a Grinch for years now. Years, so like a decade now. Emily doesn't even come close to being a Grinch because she still wants to enjoy Christmas. She just doesn't want to have to do all of the fucking pomp and circumstance pageantry and bullshit to go along with it. Like, well, it uh, makes sense. Like, 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 I don't want to have to put up a fucking giant display dedicated to Christmas. And the fact that, like, her parents are so into it, like, 
Like, what 70s, like, sex orgy were they having to where, like, we want to get my rocks off by putting up these wonderful little, little displays to Christmas. I know, her mom's like, Albert, did you get out the nutcracker? He's like, 36 inches. <laughs> like, 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 what? Like, like, it's so, like, fucking stupid. Like, this whole town has a Christmas fetish. Yeah, um... Well, I like I see what you like I, what you're saying. Basically, I mean, I completely agree. Is Emily is not a Grinch. She does want to celebrate Christmas, and she when she's coming home, she expects because she knows her parents are fucking Christmas freaks that she expects that their house is going to be all decorated, right? Because that's they don't say anything to her when they're on the phone. They're not like, oh hey yeah, we're taking a little bit, uh, we're doing a little less this year. No, instead. They just say, yeah, come on down. And then they expect her to just follow the HOA rules to set up all the Christmas. And at that point, you just be like, I'm not doing it. And then when they call her and say, hey, um, why aren't you taking care of the house? Why aren't you doing all these HOA requirements? Say, you're going to you you're going to die alone. So you just fucking left me here. I'm letting you die and you can go rot in a nursing home. See, <laughs> See that's where my inner redneck would come out of that. I be bust out the grace like Stone Cold Steve Austin lines like what, what, rip it up and ask Bob Blood because Stone Cold said so and then like you know, chug some beers in their face and give them a Stone Cold stunner. Yeah, like it, the the whole this movie, it's, uh, it's, just, it's just fucking silly. Like again, like, yeah, like it's just so stupid. Like I can't imagine living in one of these fucking suburbs where it's like. You don't participate, host. You're gonna get a, a, a citation from us. Well, it's really weird that because this movie just has a obsession with HOAs, and, and and the way that it paints it is like you're going to, even if you don't know that you like an HOA, you you might end up enjoying it. So just come in and. Just start to live in the HOA, and then all of a sudden, you're just going to be like, you know what? I do actually like all these rules and regulations that I have to follow all the time. It comes to a really weird conclusion that, like, just live it long enough, and you'll end up liking an HOA. And it has like this. It, it's almost like an HOA representative or a president or something came in and wrote this movie, and they were like, you know what? In this in this Hallmark movie, we're going to make HOAs look extremely palatable to people so that when they're watching them, they're going to think, well, maybe my HOA isn't so bad. Or they're going to say, wait, why don't I have an HOA? Or why, you know, like, why didn't we start one in our community? And it just makes it look like it's a, it's a, it's like a puff piece for HOAs. I don't, I don't understand it. It's like, other than that, this movie has no real theme or plot to it. And no romance either. Like, the romance is totally shoehorned in. This movie couldn't stand to have just like two friends. Well, I think also to community. the way Wes Brown kind of is, he's like the autistic gay person. Yeah. Who hasn't figured that out yet because he lives like, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm fine. Like, I'm, I wouldn't be fine if this movie was just, I mean, I wouldn't be fine. It's still not a good movie, but I, it would be better if the movie wasn't trying to shoehorn in a romance between Emily and Jared because there just isn't one. To be honest with you, there is. Zero chemistry here at all, and that's on West Brown. West Brown, I will speak for my queen, Lacey. Hi, Lacey. Um, West Brown is the problem because he's literally just like this over the top, autistic, fucking idiot. Like, hey, your nutcracker's not up to size. Oh, you, by the way, here's this, and I. Oh, here's this citation. Oh, and here. And it's funny in the sense, like, and he's not charismatic at all. He doesn't really have that good lines. Like, at the end, he does when he likes walking around Santa. He does have a couple of good little jokes. But he's not really charming. He's not really funny. He doesn't have anything really going for him. He's just, like, this big, like, I'm hunky man. Like, you know, and that's why you're supposed to be attracted to him. Like, just generic Hollywood, like, hunkiness to him but his charisma is negative they have no chemistry between the two and that's the biggest in this film because Lacey Chabert is 
she is fun. She is delightful. She gets a lot of stereotypical little lines, you know, constantly rammed throughout. But she is, you know, out of everyone in this film, he's by far, you know, by far the best actress and actor in this film. She, you know, knows what she's doing. Um, I think you're right. If they kind of kept it just like like a friendship or something, it'd be a little bit, maybe a little bit more tolerable. But it's so like culty of like how they kind of shoehorn in the relationship, and everyone's like, oh, "You should be checking out Jared. Yeah, he's the architect." And oh, Jared, the architect. Yeah, I heard when he busted a nut on your ass. It's beautiful. Oh, wait, I can't say that because I'm in, I'm in, you know, Christland. Yeah, it's weird. It, 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 it's like totally like, you know, it's like they're saying like, listen to here, you 40 year old whore. You haven't, you haven't settled down yet. Come on. And well, yeah. And not only that, it's, it's <laughs> because like the, the script does not have any romance to it. Like, and not, you know, it's, it just has no um, connection between them. So it has to literally tell the audience like, oh, he would make a good partner because you're sitting there thinking, if I'm Lacey Chabert, like the furthest thing from my mind is thinking about, you know, Jared as a romantic partner. I want to get away from him because he's uh, basically bothering, harassing me at my house, peeping into my windows, um, writing citations, yeah. invite, in, inviting me to homeowners meetings. Yeah, it's. It's well, like, like, really. Like, like, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. So at least, at least, I'm saying, at least, at least with Christmas in Rome, you can kind of understand our male protagonist being kind of aloof because he's the I'm a businessman. I'm trying to close this deal. Word, I'm kind of blinded by Christmas in this, you know. And then his heart is opened up by Franco Nero, beauty of Rome. Christmas. Like, it happens. Here, though, again, it doesn't make sense that Lacey Chabert is in a Grinch. She's not Scrooge. There's nothing Scrooge-like about her. She's like, I just broke up with my boyfriend. I don't have anywhere to go. I'm going home. My parents are psychos about this shit. I just want to go to my parents and fucking drink some spiked eggnog and play with my fucking vibrator and before I find my new home. No, she's got to go on an adventure to find out the spirit of Christmas. And stupid. It, it is stupid. <laughs> and the film, like, towards the end, it really hasn't t- done anything to really set up this relationship. It's just kind of like, you know, they've been working together. Jared's been kind of an asshole, but he's been making her get her house prepared for Christmas. They do a whole punk rock Blink-182 song about uh, putting up their decorations. and The car, which is getting wet. <laughs> Thank you all for my very first day. For my Christmas what? day. Whoa, how I didn't like that, that skate punks song, like, so out of left field. Who is that for? Is that for our generation of ladies? Like, ah, it sounds kind of like some 41. Was it pop punk in there? Yeah, I don't know. It's hilarious, though. Like, it, just, it does. It comes out of nowhere because they do, like, that whole... You know, the like Santa Claus style, like everybody's marching to, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, what pisses me off about that? She's like, like, well, I don't have any decorations up. Well, the, the bins are on a shelf. That's it. We can take care of that. And then 12 people show up to the house to take bins, totes down from the garage. I think, excuse me, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Like, I, I, like, what do you mean? Like, you're just going to show up and be like, don't worry. You won't hang this shit up. We will. I'm like, fuck you. These people showing up are gang banging her Christmas decorations. They're, yeah. We're going to take care of it for you. The thing I really love about these Hallmark movies is if you really look at the details, if you watch like what's going on in the scene when it's sort of like a montage or something like that, like this decoration scene, it's hilarious to watch pe- what people are actually doing. Like in this scene, like you can tell those bins are fucking empty. Steven talks the Yeah, because they're absolutely <laughs> down. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're like gently like, yeah, they're handing them down. And it's like, if that's literally loaded with Christmas shit, you'd be like, <laughs> Yeah. 
Oh, I never wear, I never wear a back brace. Hold on. Been there enough times. Uh, you see, you're, you're seeing poor Steven Toblowski getting wheeled off to the to the ER. How does it back? Oh, should be here. <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. That's a two person lift. No, and then it's really funny too. The one bin that they take down, and it has the fucking thirty. What is it? He's like forty two inch Nutcracker. And it's yeah. like that Nutcracker is not fitting in that tote. He is way too tall to fit in that tote, and it's hilarious because you'll see the tote. See the tote too, is like see, the, hold on. The, the same thing too. It's like a forty two inch Nutcracker. It's not even that big or heavy. Why are you putting that in a tote alone? So the, that, I don't know these people. It's like you know these people are really rich. Because they're like, this one nutcracker uh, decoration that's like five pounds and five feet big, like, has its own tote dedicated. <laughs> I know. Like, I know. You, you know how expensive those totes are these days? Yeah. They're not cheap anymore. Like, like it's like $40 a tote. <laughs> I thought it was so funny, though, when it shows it and the tote's closed, right? Totes clo- covers completely on it. And then it cuts back, and she's got the cover off, and the nutcracker is hanging out like two feet. <laughs> and is hanging out of the toe. It's like the toe would never close. And it's just hilarious to me. Like when you look at the details of it, it's so funny. And that, the other thing I really like too is when they show people decorating. And so, like you'll see um, later on when they're getting like the the Christmas thing ready with uh, Jared playing Santa Claus, they like show um, all the decorations, and they'll show like Lacey and Wes finishing the decoration. So they're like putting wrapping garland around something really poorly. And they're like, done. And like, you don't, you don't get to see them do any other work. We did it. Yeah. It's Thank just, you. They, they put one thing on a tree and they're like, we're done. It's great. Uh, sorry to all those, you know, set designers back there who spent seven days uh, getting the set. The I like set really that. Like they, they had the 12 man army, like putting up all Lacey's decorations. And at the end, I, Wow, what a great job you done in your parents' house. She's like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, took all the credit for it. Thank you. I, I you know. The it house- was all, it was all me. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the house looks great, but uh, it, it's not even remotely relatable in this movie. No. What does her parents do? Like, what is her dad involved in? Uh, in Utah? Probably, probably running a cult. Yeah, it's true. Probably- <laughs> part of like she some ma- uh mega pastor church yeah lds and, stuff well i mean here's the thing he's kind of looks like tony shalhoub so he's kind of a little hilly you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like you know it's like wait is that how they're faking it to get through like you yeah. know we're actually part of a hasidic family and we can get through it's just, uh, it's funny because this movie is all sorts of out there in terms of what it wants the viewer to, to gain from it. What is up with Brock Lesnar's sister, too? Fucking Pamela. Literally, like, Brock Lesnar's sister fucking trundling about and then constantly, like, I was just waiting for her to give somebody an F5 throughout this movie. <laughs> Um, what do you, what do you think about, uh, all of the, uh, the Christmas shenanigans? Where is it, is it as festive as Christmas in Rome or, uh, less festive? What do you think? It's less festive. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Is there more like Christmassy things going on? Yeah. Um, but minus five points for no Franco Nero. And more importantly, when they're doing like the snowman tableau, the snow is garbage. It's forty one degrees and they're building snowmen and like like this you can tell this was like shot on like in this the middle of the summer with like fake snow because they're walking around callously. And again, they live like in the fucking mountains of Utah because you see the fucking Rockies in the background and they're like <laughs> it's a little cold out. It's like it's not cold out. It's not cold out at all. You can tell by how it looks in the very You can tell by how it looks. That's right. Oh, well, it's 41 degrees. Oh, we're building snowmen. It's like, no, you're not. That is snow that you have is literally precious time. Because all the snow in this little cul-de-sac is like four, like three inches deep. 
So if it's like 41 degrees by the end of the day, it's all gone. <laughs> yeah, you you could tell people who write these movies, they, they have never experienced snow like that. Because you wouldn't be saying like, first of all, you wouldn't be saying 41 degrees. You Like they, this movie literally shows a girl in the background going <laughs> like she's shivering like furiously. It's like, no. 41 degrees, first of all, you're not going to be shivering people, furiously. People from L.A. write that shit. Like, yeah. This, this is what it manages like to be cold. Snow don't work like that. 41 degrees, you're not having a snowman building contest. You're making soup, soup puddles from the snow that's melting because you know, you're throwing it in the driveway to make it melt faster in the sun. And not to say not only that, to say not only that, fucking... 41 degrees, depending on if you're coming in or out of winter. If you're going into winter, you might be bundled up. If you're coming out of winter, you're going to be in shorts like, whoa, yeah. 40, 41 degrees, let's go, <laughs> you know, I know. Ce- celebrate. And so, and the, I mean, honestly, like you said, the film is super clear that they're shooting in like s- at least 70 degree a, weather. The bad cloth. Somewhere. You could see half the people in the background when they're like wearing their sweaters, like sweating their asses off, like got kerchiefs in their pocket like wiping their foreheads away because they're sweating so much no but like you can just tell yeah like it just and especially for something like utah and and where they're showing this set like climate no <laughs> no it's not not gonna be like that at all the, but the snow looks really bad and it's really funny because in the snowman contest they don't even try to make the snowmen look like snow it literally looks like, um, uh, like, what even is it? Like paper mache or something that they've like thrown together. It doesn't even look like snow. They don't even try. And what I found really funny too is that during the snowball fight, they've got like these like foam, uh, like Nerf balls that they're throwing around. And if you watch, you could see like a few of the snowballs that they've thrown are just in the road, not even broken. They're just like rolling around. You could see some uh, like a couple shots of extras going to this like uh to the curb and there's like pre-made balls there that they're supposed to be making snowballs out of. It's it's hilarious. It's the the attention to detail was just not there in this movie. Hilarious. Those are minor quibbles, I guess, because a lot of movies don't do snow very well. Like the Santa Claus, I think we talked about in that episode. Santa Claus doesn't do snow well either could tell because fucking Tim Allen is prancing around in bare feet out in the snow in that movie going you know doesn't even put on his galoshes when he goes outside to check on Santa Claus so yeah I mean to be fair most movies made in Hollywood they don't do snow very well but uh this one is a pretty bad offender doesn't even try and I guess the other thing I want to talk about is Wes Brown is awful as Santa I don't know if it's intentional they were like, oh, Jared just doesn't make a good Santa, but he's a really bad Santa. Doesn't look the part, doesn't sound the part. Absolutely horror. Bad all right. Um, what did you think of uh, Lacey Chabert's hybrid Prius? I did notice it right away. She pulls up. And they got a nice, did, nice shot of would, hybrid there. You would literally think this movie was made in 2011. The way they're like, hey, look at check out my Prius. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask, what do, you, what do you think about this movie? Uh, like, it, it seems to me like this is a knockoff of, obviously, Christmas with the Cranks. Because it does, definitely has that Christmas with the Cranks feeling. But it's also got, like, elements of Deck the Halls. Um, it's It's got, like... A, combination of all different kinds of christmas movies um how do you feel about that it aping all these things it's fine to ape things if you do it well but i this film isn't done well it's again like it's like a this whole film experience is stupid and vacuous and an anti-charisma pool so like i don't give a shit that it apes from other films whatever Ric Flair is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and he his whole entire career is aping wrestlers that came before him, like Buddy Rogers. But if you do it well, it's all that matters. This film is not done well. It's very stale. It's boring as shit. The idea is stupid. 
Like the whole homeowners non association stuff is fucking bunk and bullshit. Wes Brown is literally anti like anti matter when it comes to charisma. There's literally really nothing here to make this a worthwhile film, except Lacey Chabert. Not only that, though, too, like you, you also have towards the end of the movie that really stupid uh, plot line where um, Pamela's husband can't make it home, can't make it home for Christmas. He's gonna not gonna make his plane because his plane is uh, getting stuck in snow. And then all of a sudden, he made it home. He made it. How did you? How did you do that? Well, my ex boyfriend works for an airline. I pulled some strings, but he's your ex boyfriend. Yeah. Well, again, this is perfect land, and everyone's like, yeah. So I'm, he, he he said basically what he said was, "You guys are flying anyway. I don't care. I don't care what the forecast says. I don't what, care what the what, storm system is saying." Yeah. So what what does he do at the airline that got him on? And also, too, what did Lacey promise like a like an old fashioned like, yeah. I'll I'll give you one more Christmas tug tug before we you know. It's officially it's like over. okay, we can reenact Dick in a Box this one time. <laughs> Do you want to eat my asshole? You can eat my asshole this time, okay? Like, that's, that's what the kid's like. It's just funny, because, like, like you said, like, thinking about it, like, what could he possibly have done? It's like, like, in real life, you call him and be like, hey, uh, I was just hoping I could pull some strings here and get my friend on a flight. It was like, what do you want me to do? You want me to call God and say, hey, go and get this storm system out of here, please? He's not like that, but Pamela's like... <laughs> Another Christmas without my husband here. It's like, you see the fucking house you live in, you yeah, bitch? You got to deal with that shit. Like, like, like you're, like, you live in fantasy land. It shouldn't be called Evergreen Land. It should be called fantasy land. You live in fantasy fucking land. So the fact that your husband might come to Christmas a little late, suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. Like, like, where, like, where, like, if you, oh, fine. You want your husband to be there for every Christmas? Then don't have him make the money that he's making. Like, shit like that is, like, kind of, like, so annoying. Because it's, like... Or, or like, uh, how Lacey Chabert's parents are able to just gift her this house. This, like, $2 million house. They're like, yeah, we're moving to Florida. Here you go. Not only that, too, because, like, we learned from the beginning that she's a freelance writer. Like, here you go, the house is yours. It's, like... What does she make as a freelance writer? She's like a not, freelance copy what? content writer. So like not like so the fact that like you're gifting her this house, fine, it's a gift. She'll have to pay like a gift tax on it. But the how is she gonna afford the property tax on it? She can't. She'll go pro. Like it's not that's not generous at all. And it's it's a good thing she's fucking the HOA president because those fees I bet are probably astronomical. Just get out of those too. I mean the the movie's whole idea is just really annoying. This, you know, like if you if you stay there long enough, you put up with it, with the HOA walking all over you. Eventually, you'll end up liking it, and you want to stay here. Like it, the, I just feel like that that whole idea, that theme, is just really annoying, and the, it makes the movie. I mean, the movie's obnoxious anyway, but it just adds a layer of even more toxic elements to it. That it, I don't know. It's it just makes. Yeah infuriating and what makes it even more toxic is the fact that Lacey Chabert is like 40 years old mm -hmm. and single mm -hmm. and found me love As, well that she does she does and finds it at the end of the film it's a lie it's a lie and of course just like any other Hallmark movie it's like these guys aren't going to have any uh, rocky parts of their relationship they're just going to be they just get together and they're just married. I like the I like the fact too that Jared's also like forty years old, an architect, and no one's questioning like him. Like you think in this society, like oh, he's gotta be gay, right? <laughs> yeah, ha ha handsome and the hair and the scars and the architect job, and he's not gay. <laughs> he's uh literally got some skeletons that he hides in the closet yeah. as, a, as an architect. So he's a mass murderer. It's just, it's just a it's just a silly idea, a silly pre pre premonition. I don't I don't accept it. I don't accept this because at least in Christmas in Rome they have it out where Lacey was like I was going to have the perfect Christmas wedding, which is still in that film stupid because it doesn't really tie to anything. 
because the film's not like stupidly Christmassy, but like the fact that they tie it in, it's like, oh, okay, that's why she's in role when she's single right now. Here it's like, Lacey, you had no reason to be single. You're Lacey Chabert. Look at you. <laughs> no. You're you're a goddess. Just just go out there in your mom jeans and everything. That's right. So let's let's give uh how about the Holly a rating on a scale of zero to ten 36 so, inch nutcracker dildos. Before you <laughs> before you do that, I have a question for you. Okay. What's a bow? What's a bow? Yeah. Bow. Like a tree bow? Is that what you're talking about? Well, it was as bow as a holly. So what are you? Yeah, yeah it's it's like a tree bow. It's like a like a um uh, Group of uh, what? What's the tree branches? Bow? Oh, it's like it's a group of branches together. That's called a faggot. No, that's a bundle of sticks. Oh, oh. okay. Get your tree terminology right. Yeah, boughs are like, uh, especially with like uh, evergreens or spruces and things like that. It's like the the whole branch of needles on the on the tree. I learned what it is. I learned something today. Yeah. Which, by the way, is still one of my favorite uh, sim- older, well, newer Simpson jokes is uh, when uh, they're talking about, uh, like, oh, together we are weak like this stick, but together if we form a f- uh, function, we'll be a mighty faggot. And he, and Martin holds a bundle of sticks up, and it has to say at the bottom, like, a faggot is a bundle of sticks. <laughs> <laughs> so, go again. Yeah, on a scale of 0 to 10, 36-inch nutcracker dildos used in this uh, Utah community's Christmas orgy, what would you give? <laughs> by, uh, haul out the holly. I'll give it a uh, 5 out of 10, and for the Hallmark scale, a 5 out of 10. This is a very trite, annoying film, and bless poor Lacey Chabert's heart she's easily the best part in this film because she's like the only one that's acting up to snuff uh Scott Tobolsky does a okay job you know being like the gobsmacked idiot neighbor throw but this film was stupid mind the fact which I don't think I've ever seen Deck the Hall so I can't make that comparison but like this is like kind of like a beat by beat, like kind of rip off Christmas at the Cranks, but with none of the charm, because again, Lacey Chabert in this movie is a fucking Grinch, and we live in perfect land where there's no conflict except a mild raise of the voice, like it's just fucking gobsmackingly stupid. And the fact that there's no conflict, everyone's an insufferable twat, the love interest, you know, Wes Brown, is insufferable, an autistic wreck. Like, I don't see the charm here. I didn't believe you when you said, like, oh, an hour and 24 minutes? It's going to feel like a lifetime. It felt like a lifetime. I had to pause twice throughout this film walk away for like five minutes and come back and regroup because it was so insufferably boring at points. This is a bad Christmas movie. But I think Lacey Chabert does enough. She's charismatic. She's charming enough. It's, you know, appearing to white ladies, you know, parts and I think Stuart Tobolsky is funny enough, as insufferable and intolerable as this film can be at points. It's not the worst thing I've seen. I've seen worse. I think the fact that it is only like 84 minutes long, it makes it sufferable. You, you could sit through this and get through it. Like if you're not, if you're a husband or boyfriend sitting down, your lady wants to watch this shit, you, you can survive. It's not the worst thing in the world. But. It's a wreck of a film. And the whole HOA thing is like so... I, I, I don't know who is sitting down pining for that. Like, oh, yes, talk about the HOA rules. <laughs> oh, 
Oh yeah, like like I I, I don't I don't know who that's for. I know there's people out there for because again, Wes Brown is an autistic. Like, you don't have the kind of uh, but yeah, f- five out of ten. I wouldn't ever go out of my way to watch this again, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm probably, I actually, you're a little generous. I probably would give it a four out of ten. Um, it's not a good movie. It was, I, like I said, it was, I found it just annoying in general. Um, the theme itself about HOA, like you said, no one's clamoring for a movie about your HOA and how nice it is to live there. Um, I, I feel like it just is written in some like some sort of surreal alternate reality where people really like H- their HOAs and they want to be persuaded into having to put up like elaborate Christmas decorations uh, when they don't want to. Um, not only that, there's just like if you're watching this movie for a romance, like it is literally pasted in there in the last 10 minutes. Like, oh, yeah, and they like each other. The end. Uh, um, and not only that, too, but it just makes me question, like, where the fuck did the idea for a sequel come from? Like, all of a sudden people are like, we needed we need a second one. It doesn't make sense to me. I feel like they just shot them back to back. They had the scripts and they're like, let's just do them together. Like, let's just get them done. <clears throat> We've got Lacey here. She's expensive to get here. She, uh, you know, she's she's busy crafting her clothing line. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, while we've got her, let's just do this. And then they just crapped them out. And honestly, it doesn't surprise me, like, if this was written during, like, the writer's strike. They just, like, <laughs> pulled some guy aside and you're like, you got an idea for a Hallmark movie? Like, yeah. Yeah, let's uh, I just do an well, HOA I, one. I don't, honestly, I don't think any... Of these, uh, like they have like union writers on these things. <laughs> like, SAG writers on here. Just, they just got no, nobody from SAG or anybody just like, yeah, just grab some asshole who was like, hey, can you write something? Yeah. Sure. I mean, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be surprised if like they're purposing AI for some of them now. Like, give me a Christmas movie about lawyers. And then dude's just like fucking yeah, pull pull the shit out of their ass and and then write a script around it. This movie is just not not a fun movie. Like it's not interesting to watch. It's really boring. It takes a it it is it feels like forever when you're watching it. It's not funny. Uh, I mean, it has like a couple of moments where it's like kind of funny, but at the same time, like it is funny when you stop and like really look at the details, look at like the things that are happening in the background, look at the extras, what they're doing. Then it's really funny. Uh, but unintentionally. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't enjoy this one. Um, definitely doesn't have the charm or the romance of Christmas in Rome uh, that we did previously. So yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not excited to check out the sequel by any means. Um, yeah. Which we'll do years down. Yeah, yeah, we won't do it next time, but at some time we'll probably do it. Uh, yeah, so, that, I mean, that leaves us to to pick an, another episode for next time. And I don't really have one, and you don't have one, and we're kind of, like, playing it by the seat of our pants. We're, just like, we're literally we're just going down the ship air pipeline and picking out. Yeah, just yeah. picking ones that are, are interesting. Unfortunately, Lisa Chabert is not in Christmas in Vienna, which is featured in this movie. Well, we did mention the Home Alone 4 reference. Yep. This film does have a lot of like weird cultural references. Like, oh, it's just like Home Alone Four, trapped in the suburb. And it's like, who's ever who's seen Home Alone Four? <laughs> Not only that, but it mentions Creed and Nickelback, and then there's like seven Nickelback posters on her wall. And Not only that, though, too, when he's like, right? when he's going through, like, I know you like like it when a man blows a load on your asshole. Um, you also like Nickelback. She's like, that's true. <laughs> Look at this phone. Oh, you know what? That's a missed opportunity right there. Right. Every time we make me laugh. But yeah, we're just going through the list of Shamir movies and don't have one in mind for next time, but we'll pick one out and we'll do one. We're just... Wow, her huevos in this one picture look pretty big. But in her union suit and 
Christmas gym jams. <laughs> yeah, we're we're just kind of going through and see. We're trying to we're just trying to find the sultry ones. That's right. Yeah, the ones with the most erotica are the ones we're going. <laughs> We've been uh, zero for two, really. So, so yeah. I, 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 again, she's wear, wearing the right clothes. She's just not leaving the one button at all. Um, so yeah, if you want to listen to our, uh, more episodes on us covering Lacey Chabert Hallmark movies, uh, you should subscribe so, to us. So just so you know, too, we have strayed so far away from the original idea of this podcast. Well, that's fine. That's, that's fine. We got Frank Nero no, in the last one. So. No, I know, but it's still hilarious to think about. Like, oh, we're going to cover jellos and stuff. And here we are, close to episode 300. It's like. Yeah, we're doing we're doing things you should be. <laughs> <laughs> it warms my heart, but it's, it's just great. Like you know, think about like it's fun times. Well, you'll like. I mean, like like you said, we're we're so eclectic. You'll want to subscribe to see what else we do in the future. Um, we're pu- we're public access of uh, of a podcast. That's right. We're pretty much on many podcast apps, so you can. Search for us, subscribe. Uh, you can find us on Spotify or, um, you know, we it really should Apple Podcasts, anything. Which we never, uh, we never actually said when we were talking about Franco Nero last week. Man Pride Vengeance was our first episode. That is true. Yeah. Which stars Franco Nero. There you go. Yeah. 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 We forgot to, forgot to tie that into the, our the, big web, the big web. Yeah. Um, you can like us, follow us, whatever you do on Facebook and Twitter. We're on there. Uh, just search for us, Blood Black Rum Podcast. We have an email address at Blood Black Rum Podcast at gmail.com. Write to us. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you want us to consider for movies, and we'll definitely keep that in mind. And then also, you can donate to us on our Patreon page or our Spotify page. Anything you can give to us, we'll put back towards beer. So thanks in advance. Uh, hope you enjoyed our episode on Haul Out the Holly, and we'll be back next week with another Lacey Chabert Christmas week. So until then, take care. <laughs>